Hello students, welcome to another question. Again, this is a multi-dimensional question that covers several standards, but of course with a focus on special loans that we are currently busy with. So if we read together, it says that Becker Engineering is a company that was incorporated in 2017 and it manufactures all kinds of things that I know nothing about, like gearboxes and impellers and whatever that means. Then they say BE is regarded as a medium enterprise and they apply IFRAS. They manufacture parts that are popular in Durban, Richards Bay and also in Cape Town. They have a very high standard of products and there's a great demand for the entity's products and therefore they have been expanding. If we look at the additional information, there is a lot of focus on firstly starting with the accounting policies. And I find that the accounting policy for plant machinery and land and buildings is very similar. So they basically tell you there that they apply the um, IAS 16, the revaluation model, and that um, the items are written off over their use for lives, that they are revaluated through the net replacement value, uh, also known as the elimination method and that revaluations are in both instances recorded at year end. You will also find that a bit of important information is they tell you that land is not depreciated. Um, land is not depreciated under your policy. In terms of vehicles, you are told that again, IS 16 is applied. They, here they apply the cost model and they depreciate the vehicles over their useful lives on a straight line basis. The investment property is recorded subsequently at fair value. Of course, initially, all recording is done at the historical cost. And in terms of IS 40, we apply the fair value model. Then there are some additional notes starting with the vehicles. They say delivery vehicle C was purchased on 1 May 2017 for 300,000 Rand and it is depreciated over five years and has no residual value. On 28 February, the recoverable amount for all vehicles were determined and it was um, only delivery vehicle C whose carry value was not equal to the recoverable amount. Of course, the recoverable amount is defined as fair value less cost to sell value in use. We take the higher of those two. In this instance, they've given you the fair value and the cost to sell. Here, you need to have the savvy to know that the cost to sell now needs to be deducted from the fair value. And then we have value in use. In terms of land and buildings, they have a basically a property called Connor Towers. And they say this was acquired on 1 February 2017 for 2.3 million, where the land was worth 1 million and the buildings was worth 1.3 million. It was paid for cash and immediately rented out to Space Savers International, which is a fashion house based in Durban. The operating lease agreement signed for a period of two years, starting on 1 February, and it's 2017 stipulated that it would be 50,000 rand per month and then there would be an escalation of 15% on 1 February 2018. On 28 February 2017, the fair value of the property did not materially differ from the cost. So they're just trying to tell you that there was no revaluations done or no fair value adjustments done in the instance. This is obviously investment property. Then they've given you the fair values uh, for the different years in the 2018, 19 and 20, both for land and buildings separately. Then they tell you Becker Engineering was responsible for all the repairs and maintenance of Connors Towers. And for the year ended 28 February, this amounted to 68,900 Rand. When the rental agreement came to an end, they decided not to renew it. As from, and as from 1 March 2019, they decided that uh, they're, going, they're going to use Connor Towers for administrative purposes. The total useful life of the building is 25 years. The land is not depreciated. This is so important. And I've, I've actually just put it in bold. The difference between remaining life and total useful life. So mostly we do not have an accounting problem. We have a reading problem. And from that, I do not uh, excuse myself either. 
So the total useful life is the total life of this asset, the total span for which it can be used. If I talk about a remaining useful life, the months for which the asset has been used was already deducted. So we need to read very carefully in terms of that type of information. Lastly, we have a new investment property construction called Becker Towers. So they say as Connor Towers are now owner occupied as from 1 March 2019, it was decided that another building should be constructed for the purpose of renting it out. As no proper building was for sale in the immediate area, it was decided that the new investment of properties to be constructed in close proximity to Connor Towers. On 1 April 2019, a specific loan was obtained for the purpose of constructing Becker Towers. In accordance with the loan agreement, a loan worth 3.2 million rand was obtained at an interest rate of 12% per year. The market-related interest rate for the similar instruments is 13% per annum. The loan is to be repaid in full after five years through a one-off payment, and interest is compounded semi-annually. The construction of Becker Towers started on 1 May 2019, and on this date, all criteria was met in terms of IAS 23 in order to capitalize the borrowing cost. So please note the difference between the date when the loan was obtained versus when a uh, borrow cost capitalization can be started. It's obviously a month apart. So for the first month that the interest is, in is incurred, you need to remember that that would be a pure interest expense. They've given you progress payments that were made to the building contractor as well. They've given you a payment in May, in November, of the February of the next year, June of the next year, July of the next year. Then Becker Towers were completed and ready for use on 1 July. Again, very important date because that is the date when the capitalization of the interest should stop in terms of this specific loan. It was rented out to Room Savers International from 1 August 2020 at a monthly rental of 80,000 rand. On 28 February 2021, the fair value of Becker Towers was 3.7 million rand. Then in number one, they ask you, you need to calculate the impairment loss for vehicle C uh, as for the year ended 28 February 2020. Then disclose all general journal entries as it relates to Connor Towers for the year ended 28 February 2020. And then you need to disclose all the general journal entries of Becker Towers for the years ended 28 February 2020 as well as 28 February 2021. Right, let's roll with it. So we're going to start with number one and we have to measure an impairment loss. So for the impairment loss, we're going to look at the cost and the cost of vehicle C was 300,000 Rand. As I have said repeatedly, it's very important to be able to count the months correctly because in this instance, they've not provi provided you with any accumulated depreciation. So we need to go and count the months very carefully because once you've made an error with counting your months, everything that you calculate from that point forward will be incorrect. They tell us that the purchase date was 1 May 2017. So the first year end after that would have been 28 February 2018. Then we would have had a year end 28 February 2019. And also we'll have the current year, which is 28 February 2020, which this calculation is required for in accordance with the required part. So if I look at the difference between May and February, I count there that I have 10 months. So I even like a little toddler, I would count on my fingers and say May, June, July, August, September, October, November, December, January, February. Total of 10 months. The difference between February 2018 and 19 is obviously 12 months. And then the difference between 19 and the year 2020 is another 12 months. So up till the beginning of the year, the number of months that have gone by is 22 months. And then in the current year calculation, we have another 12 months of depreciation to calculate. So typically, I'm going to go back and say I need to have some accumulated depreciation up till the beginning of the year which is 28 February 2019. And here it's going to be the 300,000 divided by the use for life of five years. There is no residual value. And I'm going to times by the 22 months. I get to 300,000 
divided by five years times 22 months, I get 110,000, which leaves me with a carry value on 28 February 2019. And that would, of course, be the difference between the two values, which is 190,000. In the current year, I need to calculate some depreciation up till the date that the impairment happens. And in this question, the impairment happens on the last day of the year, 28 February 2020. So I need to calculate depreciation for a full year. That would again be 300,000 divided by five years times one year, or you could say 12 out of 12. And I am supposing that... You are going to have 60,000 there, leaving you with a carry value on 28 February 2020 of 130,000, if my mathematics isn't too poor, tongue in cheek. All right, now we have a carry value, we can continue to calculate our impairment. Our impairment means that we need to take the current carry value and we need to compare it to the higher of fair value less cost to sell or value in use because the higher of those two values will have to be the new carry value if i look at the information given i have fair value and i need to go and minus the cost to sell in this instance it was 115,000 minus the 12,000 103 so i'm just going to type a calculation 115 minus the 12 the value in use was given as 105,000, and obviously the value in use is now the bigger one, so I'm just going to highlight it maybe in yellow. It's the bigger one, and that should become the carry value. So the difference between my, my current carry value and the value in use, which should be the carry value after impairment, is now the impairment. So basically, if I have to like rewrite it, I would say there's a carry value on 28 February 2020 as I calculated it. 2002, I don't think so. 130,000. The new carry value should be the 105. And the difference is, of course, my impairment loss. If I look at the impairment loss... I get to a total of 25,000 rand. So that was required for number one. We had to calculate that impairment loss uh, for the delivery vehicle C. Not too shabby. Right, in required number two, they ask us to do the journal entries as it relates to Connor Towers, I believe, for the year ended 28 February 2020. All right, so if I look at what happened is we had a situation where the, the investment property had to become owner-occupied. So in other words, we went from investment property to PPE. So the first thing I know is I am now busy with the year end of 2020. So the first entries I have to make would relate to 1 March 2019. Right, so on 1 March 2019, what I see happens is they tell us that we need to now go and reclassify the intention of the asset. So a revaluation would have been done on 28 February 2019 and they would have adjusted the land to 1.2 million and they would have adjusted the buildings. Let me just open the question. They would have adjusted the it the land to 1.2 million. They would have adjusted the building to 1550000. So the first thing I need to do is I need to now go and try transfer it on this date. I will not do the adjustments because obviously the adjustments would have been in the different financial year, which ended 28 February 2019, but that was not required for us to do. So on 1 March, I need to reclassify. So I'm going to start by saying my PPE for buildings need to increase and also my PPE for land needs to increase. Right, and then I need to take that out of investment property. 
and what was the property value on the date of change? Uh, it, we are going to use the transfer values as at 28 February 2019, because 1 March is the very next day, and there will not be a difference in valuation of an asset for one day. So I am going to take out of my investment property the land, 1.2 million, and to that I'm going to add the valuation of the building, 1550000. -0. Then I am going to put it under buildings. The building's valuation was 1550000, -0, and the land's latest valuation was 1.2 million. There I have done my reclassification. Then the entries that need to be done there will follow on the last day of the year, which is 28 February, and that would be 2020 at this point. This was 1 March 2019. What I need to do is I need to go and first depreciate. And what is now kind of tricky about this question is just to remember that land should not be depreciated. So the depreciation portion that we are calculating will only um, be ap applicable to the building part. So what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm going to say I debit the depreciation. I credit the accumulated depreciation on the buildings, which is now PPE. And I need to take the value of the asset on the date of transfer, which is 1550000. And they tell us the total useful life of this asset was 25 years. So now we need to be careful with our division. Because if I now do a separate calculation, let's first sort out that part. I need to say, so the total life of this asset was 25 years. And as I've said before, I like to work in months. So for 25 years, it is going to be 300 months. Now I need to go and add up, but how many months have passed since I first obtained this building? If I look at the purchase date of this Connor Towers, they tell me it was 1 February 2000. And 17. So the first year end would have been 28 February 2017. Then we would have had 28 February 2018. Uh, 28 February 2019. And then of course in the current year we are in 2020. But we need to add, we need to calculate the time that has passed up till the date that represents the new cost price. So this new cost price was calculated on 28 February 2019. So we're going to divide this uh, cost price by the remaining life on the date that this transfer price applies, which is 28 February 2019. So if I look at the difference between February 2017 and end of February, that would have been one month. And then I would have had 12 months go by. And then between 18 and 19, there was another 12 months. So I have used up in total 25 months of this asset. So what would be the remaining life then? For the remaining, we're going to say it is the 300 total life minus the 25 that have passed. And we are left with 275 months on one, uh, 28 February 2019. I'm then going to take the 1550000. I'm going to divide it by 275. There is no residual value. It is currently PPE. Had there been a residual value, we had to deduct it. And then I am going to times by 12 months because the difference between the, J, the date of change in intention and this year end is a total of 12 months. So it's going to be this total divided by that times by 12. And if I'm just going to round, I don't think they've given any rounding instructions, so that means two decimals. Six seven six three six comma three six. There we go. That would be our depreciation um, as for the year ended um, twenty February twenty twenty. Now we still have to revalue the buildings as well as the land. 
So I'm first just going to finish my calculations as they relate to the building and then we will just reevaluate the land because the land is not depreciated. It's really quite straightforward. So on 28 February, I need to eliminate the accumulated depreciation on the building. And I write it off against the building itself. And that would have been the amount that I just calculated. This building has not been ever depreciated before. It was carried on the fair value model and it was investment property. So this is the first time. So the only accumulated depreciation that exists is the accumulated depreciation that I've just calculated. Right, that would be my second step. My third step is to go and determine, but do we have a revaluation surplus? Do we have a revaluation deficit? Here I'm going to go and say, but what is the carry value of the asset on 28 February 2020? And on this date, I am going to take the, historic, the new historical cost, which is the transfer value. And I am going to minus the accumulated depreciation on it. And I would have gotten to a carry value of 1482363. So this is then the difference between the 1550 000 and the 67. Let me just type this properly. 636,36. Don't want to do that fast. Definitely going to make an error there. Then we have to go and see what is the fair value of the asset on the date of 28 February. And if we look at the fair value, aka the net replacement value, I see that the building was worth 1650000. Zero. And if I calculate the difference there, it should be a revaluation surplus because I am increasing the value of the asset. So the difference there is 167636,36. All right, I need to account for it. So I'm going to say I increase the building which is PPE, let's just call it properly so there are no misunderstandings. And we need a revaluation surplus. And that is the calculations that you would have done as it relates to buildings. If we look at the land, there is a, also a difference in land and it increases. The land is not depreciated. So we will be skipping, obviously, the depreciation step as well as the accumulated depreciation being eliminated because there, there will be no accumulated depreciation to take out. So we will skip the steps and go straight to this revaluation surplus or deficit calculation. So if I look at land, the previous valuation was done on 28. February 2019 and there the asset was worth 1.2 million which was actually the value that we used to transfer it so you can observe it there. During the current year the land has increased in value I believe and it is worth if I can ever type 2020 correctly it is worth 1.3 million. So this land is increased by a hundred thousand, which leaves me with a surplus. I am going to then use this. I'm just going to copy this, steal this, and I don't have to type again. And this will be PPE land, of course. And for the surplus, I'm going to use the hundred thousand. And that would be the entry that I'm going to do for land. So it's pretty straightforward when an item is indeed not depreciated. Quite easy in that instance. So the only tricky part about this question was if we did not read properly. Because if you would have divided here by 25 years, you would have been in trouble and your answers would have been wrong. Because it was 25 years total use for life. 
So we had to go and deduct the, the months that the asset was already used for by the time that we got to this valuation. Right, so that was our portion of a transfer between investment property and PPE. And then we can move on to number three, which is our required part that relates to the special loan. So here we are constructing what we call Becker Towers, and this is now an investment property. If I look at the information, it's quite obvious to me that I'm busy with a calculation here where the item is repaid in, in the future. So it's a once-off payment that is repaid five years from now. Something that makes this question interesting is compounding the interest semi-annually. That can be quite interesting and tricky, again, if we don't pay attention to certain details. So if I now look at the, the entries that are required, I have already set up the portion that is required from your financial calculator. And I'm going to show you how I got to it. Right, so on my financial calculator, I firstly typed in the future value is 3.2 million rand. And that is the amount that I have to pay in the future as a one-off payment. Then for N, I had 10 because the loan was for five years, but it's semi-annually, so I had to times by two. Then for the I, I had to use the effective rate, which is the market-related rate of 13%, and the rate was divided by two because of the semi-annual calculation. For the payment, I said, and remember, this is now the payment only as it relates to interest. So the payment would be the 3.2 million that I am owing times the 12% interest that I have agreed upon in my contract. But then I also divided by two so that I can get a semi-annual payment. If I only times by the 12%, that is a rate for a total of a year. They said 12% per annum. And I'm working with semi-annually. So I divided it by two so that I can get the payment as it relates to half a year. And then I computed my present value. And I just, just a heads up, there weren't any rounding instructions. So I used two decimals in every instance. So I computed the present value to be 3084978,72. So this was straight uh, typing into my financial calculator. Then I went on to calculating my amort. So now this is quite important because what is tricky in this question again is the fact that the financial years that we work with as they end in February does not properly correlate with the terms, every six months terms or the semi-annual terms of the interest. So I have gone and calculated uh, the interest for a mort period one to one, a mort period two to two, a mort period three to three, and a mort period four to four. All right, but I have now per date, I had to split it up. And question, students will ask the question, but how do I know I have to split it up in, in, in this time frame? So how do I know I have to use April to March and then May to September? Because obviously the first interval will be April to September because that's the first six months of the um, the first six months of the contract. And then you will have the next six months and the next six months. So every amort interval will give you six months of information. But now we need to know inside the six months that's given, how do we split it up and how do we know that we should split it up like this? All right, to answer that question, I am just going to um, quickly open a paint. All right, so I have drawn up a timeline here and this is how you would know what intervals to use. So what is important is we need to go and look at a few different dates. All right, and what I need to look at is firstly, I look at the start date, if I can ever write properly. Right, so I look at the start date. Let's 
let's not be frustrated with technology right so i need to know when this will start then i need to look at the end date of the capitalization so when i talk about this i talk about the capitalization what is the start date for capitalization what is the end date for capitalization for borrowing costs and then i also need to look at my financial uh, year end which is 28 February. This is how I determine my intervals. So on the first, I have drawn up two timelines here so that I can know what time intervals I'm going to use. In the first timeline, I'm going to start with, which is 1 April, and that was 2019, and that was the date for which I have received the money. So that is the date where I get the loan then one month later here by may the first of may oh come on the first of may is when i am actually able to start the capitalization then the first or the financial year end thereafter will be uh, around here which is a 28 february 2020 right can we just imagine that that is a 20 because apparently this thing doesn't want to write properly then we go to the end date and the end date where the actual where the asset is ready for use is here on 1 july uh, 2020 right now the not the last part will of course be the year end which is 28 february of the next year which is 2021 so this is now what i have indicated uh, with regard to my start date my end date and my financial year end so what i already know is i cannot capitalize the interest here this will be a pure interest expense there because the capitalization may start on 1 may when there is a, 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 a commencement of this uh, construction. And then by 1 July, the asset is ready for use. So for this period, I can also not capitalize the interest. That's quite important. All right, so what is the second timeline for? The black timeline is for indicating my six months intervals because that's what semi-annually means. You make a payment every six months. So yeah, I'm gonna go and say in black, right, My I get the loan on one April. So when does the first six months end? So I'm gonna count April, May, June, July, August, 30 September. So let's say 30 September is round about there. So and again, apparently I am illiterate. Right, so this would be 30 September. Then the next six months will be October, November, December, January, February, and March. So the next six months will end here by March, 31st of March. if i use this pencil if it not will if it won't be better yeah all right so there there is the 31st of march it's the next six months then it will be april may june july august september so next this the 30th of september will be the um, end of that six months again so it's going to be there Right, and then it will be October, November, December, January, February, March. So here by March will be then 
the next one. Right, so now how do I count? Now I know how I need to count my intervals, all right? So the first six months will be split but through this May. So I know I need to make a split here between April and May. And the reason for that is that I need to know what the interest is that relates to this month because it's pure interest expense. Then the next interval, will it will stop here by September. Then the next uh, interval where it will stop is here by 28 February. Then the next interval where it will stop is here by July. And then obviously here by 28 February. So now I have my intervals. So the first interval, I'm just going to make it maybe blue. So the first interval will be 1 April to 1 May. Then I will have May through to September. Then I will have 30 September or 1 October through to 28 February. Then I will have 1 March through to the 31st of March. Then I will have 31st of March or aka the next day. Um, 1 April through to 1 July. Then I will have July through to September. And then I will have October through to February. And then I will have 28 February to 31st of March. So this is my intervals. This is how I identify them. I put my start dates, end dates of the financial year on one timeline. And then I put my six monthly intervals. On a different timeline then I see how they overlap so that's how I found these intervals 1 April to 30 April then May to September so that was then May to September then October to February October to February then March on its own so there was March, then uh, 1 April to the 1st of July, then the 1st of July through to September, 1st of July through to September. So I use this as my intervals. All right. So this is how I argued it out. And at the beginning, one has to do these timelines. But after a while, if you've done a few examples, like it's it, it gets easier and you just kind of figure it out without having to draw it and see it. But this is the logic behind how I got to the intervals. Right now, what I've counted, I've went and I counted the months, right, in each interval, because obviously it should add up to six months in each amort, because each amort period, one to one, two to two, three to three, four to four, represents a, a period of six months. So I need to split it one month, five months. Yeah, I need to split it five months, one month. Then I had to split it three months, three months, five months, one month. So this is how I split it up just so that it makes sense in accordance to these intervals that I've now determined. What I'm going to do is just take my answer to the interest divided by 6 times 1. Here I'm going to say this divided by 6 times 5. So I'm just splitting up the totals in accordance with the months in that interval. And of course, this would also then just simply be the difference between these two. This is three months, three months, so those two should be equal. And there I have split it in accordance with the months as it is now um, split up in the intervals. Once I've done this, now I can go and do my journals. And so now the journals are, are pretty straightforward. So the first date for which we need to do a journal is the 1st of April 2019. And on this date, we get our loan. 
So the loan was 3.2 million. And what is interesting about this item is that the present value difference differs from the future value. So what I am going to say is in my bank account, I'm going to get the whole loan. And that is with 3.2 million. However, if I record the loan, I am told by IFRS 9, I need to record it at my present value. So I'm going to go back and see what was the present value that I computed at the beginning. And that was 3084978,72. Obviously, this loan does not balance out with the bank account amount that is received. And therefore, we recognize a profit and loss item. I, sh I short a credit item, so it should be a gain. If I short an item on the debit side, it will be a loss. And I'm going to call this gain on amortization. And this is a profit and loss account. So in other words, this is an income account in this instance. The difference. And this is basically your balancing figure. Right, thereafter we have the 1st of May, and that was the date on which we make our first payment and the whole borrowing cost um, item that is now, that we are now able to capitalize is now allowable. And the payment is made out of our bank account, so we're going to say the bank is lesser, and we make this payment in order to construct investment property. And the total payment that we've made in terms of progress is 1 million. Right, then after we have our first instance where the payment or the payment of the interest is now due, and that would be the end of September. So we are on 30 September 2019. On this date, we're going to say this portion of April to 30 April would be your pure expense. And then this portion where we start with the construction can be capitalized. So that's quite important to remember. So I'm going to have an entry firstly that says interest expense. Then I am going to have another entry which is investment property. And that will be put against the loan account. So the interest expense will be the month of April because there was no construction done in that month. We only started the construction from May and then the capitalization was allowed. I'm just going to round this to two decimals. Right, so to the loan account, we're going to take the total sum of everything or the total sum of the interest. And thereafter, you would see, of course, it adds up to that amount. Then we need to go and pay the interest portion. So we decrease the loan and we uh, decrease the bank and we go back to the payment that we originally calculated at the beginning. And that was a payment of 192,000. Right, so, so that was entries to be made on the 30th of September. The next entry that is required is on the 1st of November, because on the 1st of November, we have some entry, we have an entry to do with regard to a payment. So I'm just basically going to steal this entry, and we make a payment on that date of 300,000 rand. Right. Then after we have a, another payment that is made on the 1st of February. And again, I'm just going to steal these entries. We make a payment of 900,000 rand. Now we are at our year end, and of course, we have made a special interval for year end. So at year end, we're going to say, I need to account for this interest up till year end, but actually the payment is only due in March. 
So I only, in terms of the accrual concept, need to show my interest. So on 28 February 2020, I am going to say it is capitalizable because during this period, we are still ongoing with the construction. So the investment property is increased and we need to take the interest amount to the loan. And the amount of interest up till 28 February is inside this interval. So it's going to be that total. Just rounding it properly. Right, great. Then thereafter, it is the 31st of March, and that is when this payment is actually due, 31st of March 2020. So now I'm going to say again, I have investment, property, and loan. And now I am going to take the rest of the interest, which is that outstanding month, I'm going to take to my uh, loan account. And then I need to show how I pay the interest because the interest is due in six monthly periods. So I'm just going to say loan and bank. And I believe our payment as we typed it in was 192,000. Right, that's the 31st of March. Then thereafter, I think we ha also have a payment that is made in June. So on 1 June 2020, we make a payment. I'm just going to steal that entry. And the payment that is made for progress is 900,000 again. Cool. Thereafter, I think there is a ending of um, capitalization, but the payment is only due uh, in September. So by September 2020, we have another payment to do. So I'm just going to use that date. 30 September 2020 and now again we need to be awake and we need to split it a portion will be the investment property where we capitalize the interest and a portion will be interest expense so when does it stop the capitalization stops here so I'm just going to indicate it stops here it starts there so it stops here by July. So this is the last bit of interest that we can capitalize to investment property. So I'm going to say that equals that portion. And the rest will now be a pure expense. So we're going to take it to that account. The contra account here, we always put it against the loan. And then we have to make our payment of 192. One nine two, one nine two. Right. Um, I think what we missed in between was the July payment. I just saw that there was a payment in July as well. So I'm just going to make sure that we account for it. So on one July. 2020, there's another payment, and that was actually the last payment that was made, and it was a hundred thousand rand. All right, then the next interval that we will have to account for is the year end. Um, 
something interesting is to remember, and that's something you can easily forget, the rental calculation that needs to be done as from 1 August and also the fair value on um, the last day of the year. Just a side note that we don't forget about that. Right on 28 February 2021, we need to yet again account for some interest expense now. So going forward, everything is interest expense and they ask us for only journals up till there. So the required is up till there. So we need to go and account for it. But of course, the payment is only due by end of March. I am accounting for that part. So I'm going to say it's now pure interest expense. And I need to put it against the loan. But I'm not yet paying my one night two because it's only due in, uh, in March. Right, then something else that I will have to account for on 28 February is my rental. So I would have had some rental income. And they don't say whether it's been paid for, so I'm going to say bank or debtor. And they tell us that it is rented out from 1 August at, at 80,000 rand a month. So it's going to be 80,000 rand times... August, September, October, November, December, January, February, seven months. The last entry will be our fair value adjustment of this now new investment property. So before I can do my fair value adjustment calculation, because they tell us the fair value of this asset, is 3.7 million rand on 28 February 2021. So I need to first go and see, but what is this asset worth? So obviously this asset is worth all the loan a progress payments. So I'm going to say the progress payments were all capitalized to investment property. And if I add up my progress payments, I just want to make sure it adds up to the loan amount. Um, I've learned not to assume anything. So my progress payments, I'm going to take the first 1 million. I'm going to add 300,000, which was the next progress payment. Then there was a 900,000, another 900,000, and another 100,000. And the total progress payments were indeed equal to the loan, 3.2 million. Then we were allowed to capitalize some interest. And now we need to go and add up all the capitalized interest. Where did we start? Where did we stop? If I look at my journal entries, the first interest capitalization was this 167. Then the second second one was here year end it was the 167564 then there was another one on the payment date then there was a, another one on um 30 September which was the July interval only and that's it. From that point forward, we had it to be interest expense. So I've now added up all the capitalized interest of, of this loan that was allowed to be added to the investment property. So the total there of this asset is then the sum of the two. That was 3669014.52. What is the fair value of the asset on the last day of the year? 3.7 million. So it seems to me like it's a slight increase. So the fair value income is then the difference between these two. And it was a 30,985 and some odd cents 
at fair value adjustment income. So to account for this calculation, I need to go and say, all right, I have an investment property that needs to increase and I have a fair value adjustment income and this is the value that needs to be written there. All right, so this was then your calculation that you had to do. So I'm just going to highlight everything in this in these intervals that should be considered capitalized. Then it was those two, and then it was this interval. The yellow will be all the interest intervals that should be capitalized that we have added up to get to this capitalization interest there. So I'm also just going to put it in yellow. Right, so this was a very interesting question, very nice, very complete, um, integrating so many different uh, calculations. I hope that you have enjoyed this video and if you have any questions you are more than welcome to contact me. But until I hear from you, keep well.